We've got a Cleveland Junior High School that has had more than its share of problems. Bad scene there today. We'll be going live to Kent State for an updated report on the gym controversy down there. Jim Mueller tells about a lot of joy in the Browns training camp and the Browns camp it is now. And Dick will tell us how long this rain is going to be with us. News Center 8 is next. Stay with us. News Center 8 is next with those stories and a report tonight from Neil Zerker in Lake Erie with a man and his own little island. WJKW TV 8, Cleveland. Good evening, I'm Judd Hembrick, here's what's happening. Cleveland's Addison Junior High became enveloped in still another problem today, fire. A blaze broke out backstage in the school's auditorium, filled the three-story building with smoke, forced 760 students to evacuate, and ultimately sent 32 firemen to the hospital for smoke inhalation. Addison, you might remember, was not supposed to reopen this year because of Cleveland's desegregation plan, and because the 50-year-old building was literally falling down. It cost the school board more than 100 grand to fix up Addison, and now, as a result of today's fire, it's going to cost even more. Firemen are still trying to figure out what caused the blaze, and I guess that school principal Jerry Mitchell summed up the official frustration when he told News Center 8 that, quote, we'll reopen, but it's just one more problem that we didn't need. And while firemen sift through the rubble at Addison trying to find answers, Cleveland police are trying to solve a mystery all their own. What, if anything, happened to a young woman who jumped from the Detroit Superior Bridge? Police were called to the west end of the bridge at about 9.30 this morning. They had three separate reports from witnesses who told of a woman jumping. New Center 8's Jim Fennerty was there with the first police call. But despite a search by more than a dozen officers, there was no sign of either the woman or where she might have jumped. This area is covered with weeds and brush that grow more than 10 feet high. Police think a body could be lost somewhere within it, or speculate the jumper might have gone into the Cuyahoga River. If that's the case, the mysterious woman, if she is missing, might not turn up for several days. Possible single homicide could become a double homicide. Police explain it this way. 22-year-old Valerie Bell, also known as Valerie Carmichael, who lived at this apartment house at East 56th and Kinsman, was found nude this morning alongside her bed with an electric cord around her neck. She had been dead since Saturday. The reason police are calling it a possible double homicide is because Valerie was four months pregnant. These kinds of stories are always tragic, but this young woman also had two other children. The welfare department reportedly took them away several weeks ago. Valerie also has a record of mental illness. The official coroner's ruling will not come out until tomorrow morning. Joe McCurdy owns the Chantel Carryout store on St. Clair Avenue, and today he was hopping mad, and so were all of his relatives who happened to be nearby. This morning, a man from the Internal Revenue Service showed up at his store with a moving van. The way 37-year-old McCurdy tells it, the IRS threatened to close his store down, take away his inventory, and auction off everything to make good a $7,000 debt. Back taxes, they said. Relatives, neighbors, and friends gathered throughout the morning to support McCurdy. It became loud. Police were called in. But this angered McCurdy and his friends even more because, according to them, all the police were white. We talked with the IRS this afternoon. It contends its actions were justified. Right now, though, all the inventory remains in the store, and McCurdy wants the state attorney general's office to investigate because he says he can't possibly owe that much in taxes. The first pieces of heavy construction machinery were escorted by police today onto Kent State University. Building the gym down there is on again, but there were problems. Our city camera reporter, Jeff Maynard, is down there right now at Kent State and has this live report. Jim? The prevailing feeling here on campus is that the second fight for Blanket Hill is over. That it ended early today when the construction crews moved in and began rearranging the ground where students died seven years ago. Only a few protesters were out here as the earth movers moved in. One protester stepped in front of a tractor, but just for a moment, when police told him to move, he moved. Some opponents of the gym sang a protest song, a few cried. Later in the day, about a hundred protesters and a few hundred spectators gathered for a rally. Protest leaders talked of a major national rally that they hoped to call here this weekend. They marched to the university president's office, and they broke up their march there as riot-equipped university police looked on. 
There are court cases still pending in the fight for Blanket Hill. They may be pursued, but this was a fight to stop construction of a new gym. And tonight, that construction has already started. Jeff Maynor, live with the city cam at Kent State. Whether it was some symbolic protest or just a violent act of suicide, I guess we'll never know now. What we do know is that Mark Malatesta of Columbus decided to end it all on Sunday by setting himself on fire. 27-year-old man soaked himself with gasoline, walked out on his porch, lit a match, set himself on fire. Neighbors watched in horror. Firemen were called, but all they could do was hose down the body and pronounce Malatesta dead. Mayor Perk had a big crackdown on pornography shops in Cleveland 10 days ago, closed down 18 shops. But those shops were back in business faster than the blink of an X-rated neon marquee. Today, the shops are open, and according to the store managers I talked to, business is better than ever. They say Perk's anti-pornography campaign hasn't hurt the porno movie or book business one bit. However, those same managers wouldn't talk to me on camera. They said they wanted the whole porno controversy to die down a bit first before they did any talking. There's a mother in South Euclid who says that the desegregation issue is important, but she's been fighting a different kind of discrimination for a lot of years. Mike Cragen talked to that mother today, and he has a report. Mike? Judd, for eight years, Joe Perpera of South Euclid has been fighting to get her mentally retarded daughter in public school. For eight years, the South Euclid Lindhurst Board of Education has stood in the schoolhouse door and said no. Cynthia Perpara, they said, was too severely retarded. They did not have the facilities for her. Joe Perpara contended that was discrimination. Finally, under pressure from the state and under threat of federal court action, the board stepped aside. And today, Cindy Perpara, who is now 13 years old, went to school for the first time. Cindy is unable to verbalize her feelings, but you could see the excitement as the school bus pulled up in front of her house. You sensed as she ran for the bus, she knew as of today, she was more like the other kids, a little less different. Cindy's attending class at Noble Elementary in Cleveland Heights. Transportation and tuition are paid by South Euclid schools. They still don't have a program for the severely handicapped. Noble does. Noble's principal, James McKee, met Cindy out in front this morning, and he walked her inside. He told me Cindy belongs in public school, that it'll be good for her kids, and the other children, too. Uh, retardation was catchy, and uh, now when they, they now know the retarded kids, it's not catchy, and it's something that these children can um, be productive with later on in life. For Joe Perpara, the moment of victory was clouded only by the thought of all those lost years. Well, she's lost, you know, seven of her school years that she's not been in the classroom with, peer, with her peers. I, I'm sad about that. I can't go back and recapture those seven years for Cynthia. Joe Perpara's victory is not hers alone, nor is it Cindy's alone. It's a victory for all retarded people. For as Cindy's lawyer told me, never again will a public school in the state of Ohio be able to say no to a retarded child. Judd? Another case of Legionnaire's disease in the news tonight. This one discovered at Ohio State University Hospital in Columbus. 22-year-old man has it. He's reported in satisfactory condition. This brings to seven, the total number found in central Ohio in about three weeks. We checked just before news time today and found that no cases as of yet have been found in the Cleveland area. Well, in addition to me, there's another new face here on News Center 8 tonight, uh, much more attractive than mine, Susan Howard. Susan's a new reporter, and today she's been out in Lakewood looking into an ordinance that has served to help keep abortion clinics from opening out there. Abortion clinics from opening out there. That Susan? That's true, and I can welcome you to Cleveland because this is where I grew up. So, Joe, it's <laughs> Thank awfully you, nice to be here. And you are right. Right, Lakewood has no abortion clinics, but that may change. The city is getting ready to tackle the controversial and emotional issue of abortion. The Cleveland area now has only four abortion clinics. This one is near University Circle. But because some women's rights groups were considering a legal challenge of the strict Lakewood laws governing the clinics, the city council decided to try to avoid that and make some changes itself first. But the new regulations may be just as open to challenge. One proposal would require a husband's approval for his wife to be sterilized. The U.S. Supreme Court has struck that down. All the proposals are going to be presented tonight to the Lakewood Council. I'll be there, and I'll tell you exactly what happened tonight at 11. Look forward to it. Okay, thanks, Susan. Our Trouble Cylinder 8 reporter, Tim Taylor, has been trying to get the powers that be to help a softball player get a grip. 
a good grip on his teeth. And to explain that, well, Tim's got his work cut out for him. Tim? Well, Judd, you know, even the very best shortstops can be fooled by a hot grounder when they take a bad hop. But as Mark Grattan showed me today, that ball did a lot more than give an opposing player a cheap single. The ball knocked out Mark's expensive permanent bridge work. Mark says at first the Cleveland Baseball Federation said their insurance would take care of it, but later decided their insurance did not cover such dental injuries. The contract uh, had a clause which said that therapeutic devices such as braces that were destroyed would not be replaced. And in actuality, this one was not braces that were on my teeth, but they were my teeth. In permanently, permanently affixed in your mouth. This is right. But thanks to TV8 and Tim Taylor, I got immediate action, which I don't think I would have gotten under normal circumstances. And our thanks to the Cleveland Baseball Federation's medical board for their delicate handling of Mark's case. After agreeing to review the case once more, they again decided they were not legally responsible, but from a moral standpoint, thought it would be in Mark's best interest to resolve the issue inasmuch as he does not have personal insurance to cover that work. Now, incidentally, you may have noticed the patch over Mark's right eye. He injured it playing basketball this morning, and no, he's not superstitious yet. He'll be back at his shortstop position with his new teeth next spring. Judd? <laughs> okay, thanks, Tim. I haven't been here all that long, but from my window in the newsroom, I can look out across Lake Erie and see fishermen on the inner breakwater near East 55th. They catch a lot of sheep's head out there, and for the most part, the fishermen throw them back. Sheep's head tastes pretty bad. But there's a research group down at Ohio State that's come up with a way to use sheep's head. And the fish just might find its way to your dinner table as a highly processed food snack. Researchers say it's really a tasty product, and they hope they can sell a lot of it. Well, it's tough to get to Rattlesnake Island, but our Ohio reporter Neil Zerker managed not only to get there, but he came back with quite a story. Larry Wilson, one quarter of the entire permanent population of Rattlesnake Island in Lake Erie. The other three residents are Larry's wife, Judy, their daughter, Melissa, and infant son, Joey. Larry says he was thinking of becoming a motel manager when he answered an ad two years ago for a resort manager. It turned out to be the job of caretaker of privately owned Rattlesnake Island, accessible only by boat or airplane. The island is about a mile long and has three lodges and the caretaker's home. It has one road that Larry fondly refers to as Rattlesnake Island, U.S. Highway 1. Now, many people only dream of living alone on an island. Larry and Judy Wilson have found it can be both good and bad. I think probably the only minus about being out here is there's a lot of frustrating things. <laughs> when things break down and you don't have the parts to fix it, then, oh, it really gets frustrating. At the same time, you have a tendency to become very philosophical about life and what it's all about. One problem that the Wilsons must continually deal with is what to do when you need something from the corner store and the wind is blowing, since the corner store is five miles away over water on the mainland. Neil Zerker, New Center 8 on Rattlesnake Island. And I'll just bet that the vibrations from the Browns' defense yesterday was felt all the way to... Rattlesnake Island. You can believe that. It was certainly felt in uh, Cincinnati, and they say you never can get enough of a good thing, Judd, so we'll be back to take another look at yesterday's big victory right after this. big win over the Bengals yesterday and it was such a sweet victory that we're going to take another look at it. The Browns defense was superb and there were some offensive standouts as well like Dave Logan who grabbed four passes including this 42 yarder that originated at the Browns three yard line. Bengal coach Bill Johnson called it the key play. Seven plays later Don Cockroft booted a 41 yard field goal to give the Browns a three nothing first quarter lead. In the second period, Earl Edwards, who really asserted himself, recovered this Archie Griffin fumble to hand the Bengals, or rather the Browns, the ball at the Bengal 13. Following drive stopped short of the goal line, but Cockroft was perfect again from 25 yards out, making it 6-0 Cleveland. Later in the quarter, Sipe engineered a scoring drive. Again, Logan a key target. Bryan was on the mark 15 out of 21 times for 198 yards in the contest. The game's only touchdown came a few plays later. 
And it was on this 12-yard foot race to the corner, which Larry Poole won, and with the kick, the Browns had a 13-0 lead at the half. Appropriately enough, the Browns' defense sewed up the victory on this fourth down play at the Bengal 12. Rookie Mickey Sims tips a Kenny Anderson pass, which Joe Jones intercepts, icing a victory, mighty important one, 13-3. The Browns will play their first home game a week from tonight here at the stadium against the New England Patriots. And before you start wondering if there will be a big letdown after that emotional victory yesterday, Forrest Gregg wants to put your mind at ease. I don't think we'll have any problem getting our people up for another ball game because this is a Monday night game and... So national television, this is the first time the Cleveland Browns have played on national television for several years, and this is something that uh, the football players have wanted. Uh, because besides uh, being a job and being a business and getting paid, recognition is, is part of this business. They want to be recognized as good football players, and they know that the only way they'll get that recognition is to be seen nationally. The first NFL weekend concludes tonight with the Steelers hosting the San Francisco 49ers. Pittsburgh is heavily favored, but we all found out yesterday that anything can happen. The Indians are in Detroit tonight to open a two-game stand against the Tigers, but the really big games in the American League East will take place in Boston and Baltimore. The Yankees leading by four and a half over the third place Red Sox play in Beantown, while the Orioles, who are three and a half back in second place, host the Blue Jays of Toronto. Unless it's underwater tonight, Finney Stadium will be the site of a showdown between this Cleveland State soccer team and the sixth-ranked squad from the University of St. Louis. You can bet the Vikings will be up for this one. Well, this has always been a situation, uh, um, you know, I, my own remark about that is may it ever be like that, you know, because uh, if you can't gain somewhat of a reputation and a measure of fame by beating St. Louis University, then we, you know, we won't be in the position we have been. And uh, uh, yes, most teams definitely get up for St. Louis U. The Cavaliers will open their full training camp tomorrow out of the Coliseum. Bill Fitch will welcome the veterans as well as those who survived last week's rookie camp. And Judd, I'm sure the Browns would like to uh, say that uh, welcome to town and the big victory yesterday helped make it a good one. Football it sure did. I watched the whole game. Heck of a game. Dick, you got a lot of new things to show us in the weather tonight. We have color radar and Detroit wishes they had a radar altogether. It was hit by lightning and destroyed today. We'll see color radar and more after this. <laughs> Our weekend was a warm one, as we thought it would be, but we had much more rain than uh, we bargained for. As a matter of fact, the last three days have seen a lot of rain in northern Ohio, some areas in the last 24 hours more than two inches. We have a current temperature here in the city of Cleveland at 68 degrees and the humidity 89 percent. The barometer is... Uh, 29.75, that is on its way down. The wind is south-southwest at 12, and precipitation today has totaled just above a tenth of an inch. But again, many areas have had much more rain. Looking at our radar now, we will see that uh, we have a good deal of uh, ground clutter close to the uh, city of Cleveland. There are some rain echoes moving on to the east. We had a line of thunder showers move across here earlier this afternoon. A look now at the uh, surface map will show that we have a weather front that is right across uh, the counties of Ohio now. Incidentally, the high today was 77, the low 62, and a year ago, 77 and 51. The Lake Erie water is 69. Winds on Lake Erie south and southwest at about 12 to 20 tonight, and then turning northwesterly overnight as this front angles across, and by early this evening is moving into the western counties of the state of Pennsylvania. A couple thunder showers very heavy in the extreme northeast, one over Erie, Pennsylvania, and they had a peck of bad weather at Erie yesterday with a tornado touching down, <coughs> excuse me, at Lake City that did cause a good deal of damage. A weather satellite at early afternoon will show this pattern. And here we see the very dense cloud cover that is over the state of Michigan and the Great Lakes. That is caused by a deep low that is right now over Michigan. There is a cool front, as we indicate on the Ohio map, running out of that low well into the south. High barometer is out here, but it is going to have a hard time coming in. This airflow around that low pressure area is going to cause a rather unstable air condition tomorrow. So I look for a good deal of cloud cover again Tuesday before Wednesday. We'll see the arrival of this high out of the southwest. Very warm, 80 plus readings here. It's a very humid atmosphere. That's what we have been in since the weekend. Behind it will come much cooler air. For tonight then, we can look for some occasional showers. There's still a chance of a thunder shower in the area until I would say about eight or 10 o'clock. Cooler, the overnight low 57. For tomorrow, again, a mostly cloudy day. There's a chance again of a shower coming off Lake Erie at any time. And uh, high tomorrow, 65. Now looking ahead, Wednesday looking real good. 
we should see mostly sunny skies. The high 68. Thursday beginning to cloud up again as a low pressure area forms. 75 with a chance of a few showers Thursday night. Friday partly sunny with a few morning showers, but the Friday high 70. Right now Saturday looking very good, mostly sunny and 68 degrees. So uh, getting better by the weekend. Okay, thanks Dick. It just might be a trend. It appears that Ohio businessmen are being strapped in business by certain laws. News and Public Affairs Director Virgil Dominic has a comment. It didn't make any headlines, but we think a statement by an Ohio businessman the other day deserves the widest attention. R.A. Stranahan, president of Champion Spark Plug of Toledo, said that Ohio legislators have placed so much regulations on business that his firm has abandoned all thought of expanding operations in Ohio. Stranahan blames the Ohio legislature, and I quote, Hardly a week goes by that our free spending lawmakers are not bombarding business with laws that make it more difficult for our free enterprise system to work and lessen our ability to compete because of irresponsible profit-destroying regulations." End quote. We hope the Ohio legislature is listening. Perhaps we need to listen too. For too long, business has taken the rap from all kinds of pressure groups who blame business for all kinds of social problems. Perhaps we need to go back to page one in the economics textbooks. Without business and business profits, there are no jobs. And without jobs, there is no society. TV8 asked members of the Ohio legislature to respond to Mr. Stranahan's remarks, particularly those members who serve Greater Cleveland. And we'd like to ask them all a question. Are you working to save business in Ohio or to destroy it? We'll be very interested in the answers. I would like to say hello. This is my first night on the air in Cleveland, and I've got to say that I'm more than just a little nervous. I hope that you'll bear with me and my butterflies, at least for this week. Because it's a new market to me, a new audience, new station, new set. Basically, we've started a whole new thrust here at News Center 8, and I hope that in the weeks and months, and if all things go right, years ahead, you'll see that Dick and Jim and I, as well as the entire repertorial staff and behind-the-scenes people here at TV 8, are trying desperately hard to bring you a very informative, different, more communicative approach to TV news. And because of our intensified efforts, we think there will be a new wave of competition between the TV news departments here, and that's good, because that makes the news product better all the way around, and the audience truly reaps the benefits. So watch out, competition. While you're still having fun, we're going to be working awfully hard to stay number one. That's the news at 6. Hope you'll join us again tonight at 11. From Washington, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite.